talking about uh, two more, uh, another type of index structure. Uh, we're going to finish up, up talking about tree indices, and then we're going to start talking about uh, hash indices. Now, I'm not entirely certain I'll be able to get through all of this uh, today. Uh, so, for those of you who printed out the slides, uh, this may actually include slides from next week, uh, from Friday as well. Uh, but before I get to that, I would like to quickly uh, mention something about the project. Uh, so there is a, uh, as many of you have noticed, uh, Plaid node needs to be, uh, you need to know what kind of uh, subclass of Plaid node uh, you're dealing with in order to interpret a query. Um, although it's in the source code, uh, some of you may not have noticed it, uh, Plan node has a field called type. Now there's an enum, uh, which defined, basically has one value for every subclass of plan node. So essentially what you can do is uh, take, uh, take a plan node, let's call it Q, and you can cast it to a subclass based on the value of that type field. Uh, does that make sense to people? And does that... Uh, answer questions that uh, some of you may have had. Okay. Um, so while, while we're on the subject, are there any other questions about um, the, the project? Okay. So all, you're going to, all of you are going to get at least a 90 on the project, right? Okay. I, I don't like that silence. That, yes. data values, uh, the most effective way, the most efficient way, and the way that will get you, uh, so on project three, um, I, I've mentioned this before, I'd like to reemphasize it, on project three, uh, although this, this won't contri uh, contribute to your grade, I will be posting rankings of uh, basically like the top uh, 10 performing projects uh, of, of that. So. Uh, if you want to earn the eternal fame and adoration of your peers, uh, you may as well start optimizing at this point. Um, and speaking of that, uh, probably the most efficient way of implementing this would be to use the, the sort of iterator interface, uh, to build something akin to an iterator interface, and then have implementations of all of your classes, uh, all of the algorithms in terms of that. Does that answer your question? Please. Okay, uh, any other questions? So, I'm going to ask again. Everyone's going to get a 90, right? Yes. Great. Okay. All together. Yes. 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 Great. Okay. All right. So, quick recap. Um, on Monday, we talked about uh, tree indices. Uh, we specifically talked about two types of tree indices, um, I, ISAM indices and B plus trees. Um, ISAM trees are essentially static trees. You build them up once, and then you sort of hope that the data kind of follows the, the characteristics that you, uh, basically that the data stays in more or less the same basic structure. Uh, B plus trees have, uh, are, are dynamic, which makes them uh, a little less efficient to work with, but at the same time, uh, they can adapt to changing data much more effectively. Uh, and they do that by splitting and merging as data is added or removed from the tree. And that allows us to keep the tree uh, balanced. So we have, essentially, at each node, roughly a comparable amount of data values. Now, uh, something I'll be returning to in a couple of slides, uh, this, this idea of um, fan-outs, the number of uh, children at each node, uh, is, is important. So why, why do you want as many children of each node uh, as possible? Yes, so if, uh, if you have more children, then you can uh, have a shallower tree, which in turn means you have to do fewer IOs in order to do a lookup means the amount of work you need to do at each, uh, at each node is potentially higher, 
but usually the dominant cost is I.O., so that's fine. And we'll return to the question of how do we get higher fanouts in a, in a slide or two. Uh, but first I just want to recap something uh, from last week, that, uh, from last class, that I have, uh, didn't have a huge amount of time to go into. Uh, so I've I described how, uh, how you do redistribution at the leaf nodes. So if I were to delete, say, 21, rather than trying, oh, sorry, not in this diagram, but if I were to delete, say, uh, where's a good example, uh, 14, um, uh, in order to preserve the guarantee that at least uh, half of the space is consumed, uh, normally I'd have to do some merging. Uh, but if I didn't want to do that merging, what I could do is essentially borrow this 8, shift this 8 over here, and then I'd have to update this, uh, this separator value. Now what happens if you need to uh, perform a similar sort of, sort of redistribution um, on the, the uh, tree nodes, the, the index nodes? So uh, in this case, we have at, this, uh, at the second level uh, five values, and we'd essentially like to take some of these values and we'd like to push them into here, uh, push them into that uh, second uh, page, which is now only a quarter full. Now, in order to do that, um, remember that, that there's a distinction between uh, where, where the separator values come from uh, for the leaves and where the separator values come from uh, for the, the trees, uh, sorry, for the, uh, the tree nodes. Um, so here, uh, this 17 is a copy of this 17. Because this 17 is here, that means we're going to take that 17, we're going to put it into the, the root of the tree. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, this 22 doesn't actually appear in, in this set. And the reason for that is that this 22 is essentially sort of, uh, you can think of this 22 as appearing um, to the left of the leftmost separator in the, the uh, index page below it. So when we want to uh, rebalance this tree, what we essentially need to do is take that 22 and we need to put it back um, onto, uh, basically take all of these, these pages, put them in order, and then uh, rebalance and then sort of take the, uh, the, the, uh, the middle page and move it up. So what we end up doing is essentially this sort of, re, uh, this sort of rotation um, through the index. So the values kind of go up and then back down. Um, does, does that make sense? Sorry I didn't have uh, enough time to cover that on, on Monday, but is that sort of, are there any questions about that? Okay. Um, so, okay. Um, so let me get back to this question of um, how do we put more, more data in a page? Uh, so, I've been kind of describing these keys as if they were uh, fixed size. So I've been talking about integers. But oftentimes what we're going to be dealing with are strings. And if we have sort of really long strings, then we end up having to pack uh, more data into one of these pages, uh, less data into one of these pages just because the strings take up so much space. Uh, we can have fewer pointers. Uh, so ideally we'd like to keep these strings as short as possible. So for example, if I have uh, three keys, uh, Dan and Yogurt, David Smith, and uh, the Varapandra Murthy um, book, book example, I, I'm not going to try and pronounce that, um, then we want to uh, shorten these, these values down a bit. Um, so in this case, uh, D-A-N, uh, sorry, D-A appears in uh, two of these, these keys, these separator keys. So we could potentially shorten it down uh, basically to the first distinct character. So DA appears in the first two keys. We could shorten this one down to DAN and DAV here. Uh, since DE only appears in the first, uh, since DE doesn't appear uh, duplicated anywhere in here, uh, we could potentially use just the first uh, two keys. Does, does everyone get this basic idea? And if so, uh, it, is there something I'm overlooking? So is it always the case that we can use, uh, we can take this, this string of separator, this, this set of sep 
separator keys and abbreviate it to this set. No, one. Okay, so if you had, let's say, David Jones, uh, that might potentially... So David Jones comes before David Smith. So you'd end up with uh, David Jones falling into this. Um, so <coughs> essentially right. Um, if we need to, if two different, uh, sorry, we need to not just pay attention to the, the keys, the, 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 um, separate, the preceding separator key, we actually need to look at all of the values uh, in the preceding, um, uh, the, the preceding data page. So if, if this page contains uh, David Jones, then we could only abbreviate this up to David S. Example. Okay, uh, so that's that's a somewhat minor point, but potentially useful. Uh, one other thing to uh, bring up about the plus trees is that insertions, as I've mentioned, tend to be very expensive because you have to rebalance the entire tree. And if you just have a, a huge uh, data set and you want to load that entire data set into uh, into a page, uh, sorry, into an index then it makes sense to have a special method to sort of build, up, build the index over the, those, uh, those data values as you're inserting them. So what you're going to do is start off with, uh, by sorting all of your data values. That's for the first step always, and of sorting your data values, and create an index that points to precisely, uh, that points to the first, uh, the first page in your sorted data set. What you're going to do now is you're going to keep adding uh, pages, and you're going to do this in more or less the, the, the normal way, but you're going to split a page whenever it becomes uh, full. So in this case, I'm going to start off, uh, as before, uh, root page pointing at 3, 4, and I'm going to insert 6, 9, insert 10, 1, and now my page is full. So I need to take this, this index page, I need to split it. And then I have a new index page now, and I can start inserting into that. And once again, it, this index page now, sorry, this index page now fills up, which in turn makes this index page fill up. So I need to split not just this index page, but also, oh, sorry, I can still fill in things on that page. Now I have to split the top index page, and Essentially, the only uh, pages that you ever need to split are um, everything along the top right branch. So uh, the root, uh, everything, and everything to the right of the root, uh, or the, the, the rightmost page of the, the root. Uh, does that make sense? Any, any questions about this? Um, so this, this is generally uh, more efficient, not just because it allows you to build the index more efficiently, but also because uh, you have to lock fewer things. And when we get to concurrency control, you'll see how that uh, could be a problem. Um, it also means you can use fewer IOs. So let's say you have a sorted data set. Um, how many IOs would be required to write the full index? How many IOs? Uh, how many re, uh, things would we have to read? And let's say, let's say we can keep uh, we can keep things in memory. Uh, we just have to load them in the first time. So, at the very least, what do we have to read in? Well, uh, so the, we're, we're building the, the pages of, of the index. We don't. Um, let's say we can keep all of the in, uh, for the moment. Let's say we can keep all of the index pages in memory. Um, First off, do we ever need to look at more than one of these pages, at, uh, more than one of the data pages at a time? No. Okay. So, how many read IOs do we need to do? One for one for each page. Okay. Um, all right. Now, how many IOs? Hypothetically, at the very end, we'll have to have um, written each index page uh, at least once. And let's say we have a fan out of two. How many index pages will we have? OK, 
that this is actually somewhat non-trivial. If the fan out is, uh, is two, then there would be one index page for every single uh, data page. Um, actually, the terminal is a bit more complex. But, um, okay, how, many, how much memory do we need at any given point in time uh, to store the, the index that's being as it's being constructed? So if we're uh, if we're writing, uh, so we're starting off with with this page. We need to keep this in memory. Now we split this. We get another page, and uh, we start updating this page. If this splits, then this gets affected, and we start writing to this page. If this splits, then this gets affected. If this splits, then this gets affected. Does anyone sort of see the pattern at this point? How many pages do we need to keep in memory? Sorry? Exactly. So uh, basically, we just need to keep one page for every level of the index, so the depth of the tree. Exactly. Um, yes? Uh, which data value? 23. 23. Uh, yeah, so it, it, well, it, if we wanted to read the value 23, we'd have to start at the root of the tree, uh, read a page, next level, read a page, and so forth. Okay, this is probably enough to uh, So if we wanted to read the 23, uh, 20. And that is actually a typo. That should be a 23. Thank you. Uh, uh, so that, that should be a 23. That should be the 20. Uh, sorry for that. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, that's, that's a 35. That's a 35. And that shouldn't actually be there. Uh, all right. I, there, there, the, the correct version of this diagram is in the book, and I will update the slides and post them. Uh, sorry, um, that is a um, But is uh, okay. Yeah, that's uh, the the precise values in there are mistaken. But essentially, you always uh, you always split the the rightmost uh, page at, at at any level. Um, Okay, so, uh, all right, one more very, very quick comment on the plus trees. Um, I've been kind of saying that there is a fixed, that there are a fixed number of entries on each page, uh, or that the entries are of fixed size. Uh, so one other sort of consequence of them being uh, potentially variable size is that you're not, there's no specific number of entries that you should keep in a page. Um, Anything I've said for, uh, when I say the, the page should be at least half full, um, usually the, the way that that gets interpreted in practice is that the page should be half full in terms of bytes used, uh, not in terms of entries allocated, because you usually can't necessarily allocate a fixed number of entries. Um, and this is true even if the, the records themselves are fixed size. Uh, so if a particular key appears multiple times, we may need to uh, store multiple records for that particular key. And so the, that one key may have a variable sized entry. A um, couple of rough figures. Uh, typically, these, these trees don't actually end up being uh, especially deep. Um, you can see, uh, if, if the tree has uh, a fan out of 133, which is fairly standard. Uh, at depth four, you can basically store three million records. And at depth five, uh, that goes up by another uh, two orders of magnitude. Uh, so it, essentially, these records can, you, you can, you can store a very large number of records in one of these indices with a very shallow tree. 
Um, and one other thing to note is that, uh, before we finish up uh, B-trees, is that the, the top levels of the index are actually fairly small. Uh, so at depth 3, you have about 2 million records. And let's say uh, 8 bytes or so for each record, uh, we're basically talking about 20 megabyte, uh, 40 megabytes of space. And that will easily fit in main memory. Uh, so you can basically store all of those values in, in a typical buffer pool. Uh, any questions about this? Any questions about B, B plus trees in general? Great. Okay. So let's move on to um, exciting hashes. Um, so, <laughs> next time a cell phone rings, I may or may not pick it up for you. <laughs> All right, uh, hash based indices. So, um, like a tree, the basic API for a hash index is uh, similar. Uh, you, you give it a key and you get back. Um, a record or a set of records. Now, unlike a tree index, um, the only thing you can do is get back a specific key. Uh, a tree index cannot um, give you a range, uh, sorry, a hash index cannot give you uh, a range of keys or records matching a range of keys. On the other hand, uh, equality lookups are, can be done in constant time rather than uh, logarithmic time in, in the number of records. So it's much better if you want to do equality, uh, equality lookups, but it's potentially worse. Uh, in fact, it doesn't support range lookups. And uh, also, just like uh, there's, there's this distinction between uh, the, the static ISM trees and the, the dynamic B plus trees, uh, we're, all, we're going to talk about a couple of different hashing methods uh, which have a similar distinction. Uh, one where sort of the index structure is uh, static, and a couple where the index structure actually changes uh, depending on uh, various characteristics of your data. So uh, just a quick recap. Um, this slide is copied from one a couple of uh, lectures back. A hash function is uh, sort of a, a function that takes in a value uh, that can be of any size, and it gives you back a fixed size, uh, you might say summary of that data, uh, a fixed size deterministic value. Uh, and this is used all over the place. Um, any sort of uh, OSX, uh, sorry, any sort of Unix implementation uh, is going to have this uh, MD5 function as part of open SSL. Um, and well, this, these these kind of appear all over the place. Uh, the one thing I'd like to uh, amend to that slide is that if you have some hash function that takes in a key and gives you back a number between uh, one end. Uh, M, you can take that number between 1 and M, and you can sort of force it down uh, to the range uh, 0 to N by using the modulus operation. Um, show of hands, who knows what a modulus operation is? Excellent, good, okay. Um, all right, so in the simplest, the absolute, absolute simplest uh, form of hashing, um, what you have is this hash function that takes in a key, you use the modulus operation to restrict it to the range 0 to n minus 1, and uh, that basically determines which of a whole range of buckets uh, that particular entry goes into. First, the buckets might fill up, so if you end up with uh, more records than you can fit in that particular bucket, you're going to need to keep a linked list of overflow pages. So this we've, we've kind of covered a couple of times, uh, but just in case, are there any questions? Great. Okay. Um, so uh, one quick question, um, how do you pick N? I've been sort of saying that you know, there's this number of buckets. How do you go about picking N? Okay, so you get a uniform just okay, sure. Um, but there's still a there's an infinite number of primes. How do I pick the one that's just right for me? Uh, 
Okay, now what if that changes? Um, so, essentially, if, uh, exactly, this, uh, the, the value n should be more or less proportional to the number of keys that you have. And that's a really big assumption. So if you, if you know how many keys you have in advance, great, you can build a hash table for it uh, amazingly well. Um, if you don't know how many keys you're going to have, then you run into a problem. Uh, if you pick n to be too small, you end up with these huge, huge linked lists of overflow buckets. And if you pick n to be too big, you end up with a lot of buckets that are empty and, and essentially a lot of wasted space. Um, and as a coral, uh, yes? Um, the short answer is that that's beyond the scope of this course. The uh, long end, the slightly longer answer is that um, prime numbers. I, I, I actually have to think about this a little bit to, to give a, a, a solid answer, but the, the intuition is that a prime number uh, would give you a more uniform distribution of uh, data values through the modulus operator. Um, to give you a, a sort of example of a bad case of this, um, let's say I do modulus 2, that's going to pick the last, uh, sorry, let's say I do modulus 8, um, that's going to pick the last three bits of the data value. Um, now let's say I'm using ASCII code, uh, ASCII characters. Um, the data values that, let's say the hash function itself is, is not particularly interesting, it just uh, it is, is a, a, an uh, XOR of all of the data values. If the, the last three characters, uh, if I'm using only ASCII values, then there's likely going to be a, a pattern on the last three uh, bits of, of the hash. And using a, modula, uh, using a modulus that is a prime number can potentially give you, um, it is less likely to, to result in the, the sort of deterministic uh, behavior. Um, I can, Let's, uh, if you have further questions, if we can talk about it after class. Uh, but okay. Um, right, so in, in general, what, what is relevant is that if you pick n to be too small, you end up with uh, lots of overflow chains, and, and essentially you're not doing, the hash table is not doing much for you. Um, if you pick n to be too big, not only do you end, do you end up with lots of wasted space, but because each of these buckets is, is not particularly full, uh, you, if you, let's say, want to do a scan of all of your data, you have to read in all of these pages, and that's going to provide much worse I.O. performance. Um, so we'd like to have some way of essentially adapting this hash table to the current number of data values that we have uh, in, in, our, in the relation that we're indexing. And there are two, there are two algorithms that we're going to uh, discuss for this, uh, one called extendable and one called linear hashing. And in time permitting, I'm also going to talk about a third uh, that's a bit more recent called uh, consistent hashing. So uh, the first of these is called uh, extendable hashing. And again, the idea is that if a bucket becomes full, uh, you rather than trying to append an overflow page, uh, just make your directory bigger. Um, so, if you, sorry, make your hash table bigger. So, if you run out of space, increase the number of buckets. Uh, does anyone see an immediate problem with that? Mm -hmm. yes. Sorry? Um, yeah, so basically you'd have to, uh, essentially you'd have to read in all of the pages and redistribute all of those pages into new buckets. So, uh, solution, uh, one potential solution is to add sort of a level of indirection. So rather than redistributing the, all of the data in your hash table, you have some sort of organizational structure that um, you basically when you double the size of the directory, you only have to modify uh, that specific uh, organizational structure. So what does that look like? Well, here we have uh, this sort of level of indirection. We're going to call it a directory. Um, we have four hash buckets, and here I've identified them by their, uh, the binary corresponding to uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, 
extendable hashing keeps track of uh, two values. So for the directory, we're going to keep track of a global depth. You can think of this as the number of bits uh, that are required to distinguish these buckets. So here it's a depth of two. Uh, we have four buckets. That means uh, two bits are required to identify each bucket. Uh, for each data page, we're going to keep around uh, what's called a local depth. And local depth, uh, for the moment, assume that that's going to be equal to the global depth. You'll see how it uh, starts to diverge in a moment. Now, to, to look up which bucket a particular data value belongs to, you're going to hash it, you're going to get a set of uh, values, and then you're going to look at the last two bits. Essentially, the mo you're going to compute modulo uh, power 2 to the global depth. Um, right, now let's say we want to uh, take, uh, take this, uh, this hash table and insert the value uh, 20 into it. And let's say, again for the sake of argument, uh, rather than defining a, a hash function, I'm just, just going to say that the hash of 20 uh, is 1100. So we're going to we're going to start off by looking at the last global depth bits, 0, 0, which maps to bucket A. Bucket A, this point has four entries in it. Let's say that fills it up. So normally we have to add an overflow page. Uh, what we can do instead is split bucket A. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these records and we're going to copy them. We're going to create an exact duplicate. Um, Except, and now we're going to add another bit. So we have, we've, we've doubled the number of directory pages, which means we need another bit to distinguish the values. Uh, so now we have three bits, which increases our global depth to three. And as, as I said, we're going to essentially copy all of these records exactly. So uh, page, um, what is this, page, uh, or, uh, page 5 is now going to map to the same place as page 1, namely bucket B. Uh, does everyone get, uh, get what's happened up to this point? Hmm? Yeah, we've essentially doubled the number of pages, but each of, the, each of these directory pages still points to the same place. Um, each of the, the duplicate directory pages now still points to the same original directory uh, data pages. Okay. But we still have to split bucket A. So we're going to take bucket A, we're going to add 20, and we're going to repartition all of the data inside. So let's say 4 and 12 uh, now map to uh, uh, 4, which puts it in, in this, this new bucket, and 32 and 16 um, map to that old bucket. We're going to create a new, bu a new data page, and we're going to create a pointer going from um, Essentially, the, the data page that we've just allocated, sorry, the directory entry that we've just allocated uh, to the new data page. Um, does everyone get, get what's uh, happened up to this point? How we, okay. Um, and sort of the, the, the key insight here is that any data page that hasn't been, um, that hasn't been split doesn't need to be copied, because all we're doing is updating pointers to the right place. So now, uh, we also have to do one other thing, which is to update the local depth of certain pages. So we're going to leave the local depth of all of the pages, except for the one that got split um, alone. The one that got split, we're going to increment its local depth by one. Now the general way of looking at this is that if the, the, local, the difference between the local depth and the global depth is essentially how many, um, how many entries are, are pointing, um, how many directory entries are pointing to that particular uh, data page. Uh, so in this case, L, uh, the local depth, uh, in the case of, of data page A2, uh, the local depth and the global depth are equal, which means exactly one page is, is pointing to A2, but one directory entry is pointing a2. Um, in the case of, let's say, bucket C, uh, the local depth is 2, the global depth is, uh, is 3, which is a difference of 1, which means that 
essentially the bucket C uh, hasn't been split, or ha has, has undergone uh, one fewer split than the rest of the entire, uh, than the rest of the entire hash table, which means that uh, bucket C has two entries pointing to it. If C's local depth were one, uh, then it would have four entries pointing to it. Uh, but, sorry, the, the difference, it's, uh, the difference raised to uh, uh, two to the power of the difference between the local depth and the local depth. Sorry? Um, so every split um, essentially doubles the number of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of pointers pointing to a particular data page. So uh, essentially if the difference is one, it's there are two pointers. Uh, if the difference is two, then it's, it's essentially missed two splits worth of uh, two splits. Uh, so it would have four things pointing to it. So it's essentially two to the power of the difference between uh, global depth and local depth. Um, if it's so, if I if I were to split again, I um, I would take all of these records. I would copy them again. So now I have. Uh, both this record pointing to it, this record pointing to it, and then it's cop the, the two corresponding copies. This, this ever, yes? Uh, if there's a in front, it's like a So we're we're going to look at the global uh, the, the last global depth bits. So in this case, that would be one zero zero. I'm going to go down here, one zero zero. Follow this pointer, and it's going to go to eighty. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now there's sort of a, a nice feature here. Uh, the splits can be you, you can sort of uh, have the, these data pages catch up on splits. So you'll note here that uh, data page B is starting to get a, a little bit full. So let's say I were to insert uh, the value 31, which has uh, 1001. Now, I'm going to do a lookup. I'm going to find zero, zero, the last three bits, 001, and find that that points to page B. Now, normally I'd have to do a split, uh, but since B has a local depth that is lower than the global depth, I need to split this data page, but I don't actually need to, do, uh, to double the size of the directory. All I need to do is, is split that one page. Um, so I'm going to create a new page, B2. I'm going to split all the partition all the data between it, and then all I have to do is update uh, the pointer, um, the pointers appropriately. Does everyone follow? The partition of the data is based on hash. So, uh, loosely speaking, um, the the data values that appear in one of these pages uh, are going to uh, share the last local depth bits of their hash. Um, so, if I if I split, I'm going to increment the local depth by one, which means I'm just going to look at another bit and use that that extra bit of the hash decide which of the two pages the data goes to. Is that it or right? Yes? Uh, if we further split B, then the local depth of B2 will also change, or only B and new B3 will change? Uh, so at this point, B now has a local depth of 3, yeah. and B2 has a local depth of 3. If we need to split B further, yeah. then we'd have to split, then we'd have to double the directory size. Yeah, that is fine. But what will be the value of local depth of B and B2? Uh, if we just need to split B, then B's local depth would go up. B2 is no longer connected to B. So you said uh, it will be uh, like 2 raised to difference of global depth and local depth, right? Uh, yeah, so if we split, if we double the directory at this point, um, the local depths would stay the same. Uh, the global depth would go, go up by, by one, and all of the pointers would get copied except for the page that's getting split. So essentially, all of the the number of pointers point, excuse me, pointing to a particular page would be doubled. Does 
that address your question? Any other questions? Kind of a crazy algorithm. <laughs> okay, uh, not, not less crazy than the next one, which we'll probably cover next week, or uh, uh, on Friday. Um, Uh, so if we, uh, if we delete data values, if, uh, if a data page becomes empty, then it does make sense to start, uh, it, it could potentially be possible to merge two data pages together. And the process for doing that is essentially the reverse. Um, I, I don't have slides on that, but uh, you could essentially say, so for example, if I were to uh, delete 4, 12, and 20, I'd end up with uh, this data page being empty. All I, uh, then what I could do is, um, so the, uh, the thing pointing to that particular page is 100. So I look at the last, um, the, the local depth is now three. Um, I essentially want to decrement the lo local depth. So I look at the, uh, the last two, I should say three minus one uh, bits of the thing pointing to that particular page, and I find the other thing that points, uh, that, that has the same last two bits, namely uh, this page. And then I just take this pointer and update it to point to that data page. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Um, Okay. 
Uh, all right, so we're, we're running a bit uh, low on time. Let me just finish up on extendable hashing, and we'll resume with uh, linear hashing on Friday. Uh, so extendable hashing is, um, the, the global depth is basically the, the maximum number of bits that are required to determine the data page of an entry. Um, if two things point to the same place, you may need fewer bits. But the global depth is essentially the, mo the maximum number of bits that you need to uniquely identify a particular data page. Uh, the local depth of a bucket, as I've been saying, is essentially the number of bits uh, that are required to identify uh, a data value, that are the precise number of, of bits that are required to identify uh, a data value that appears in that, in that bucket. Um, uh, it, so, <clears throat> now ideally we'd like to keep, uh, just like with the tree indices, we'd like to keep the entire directory page, uh, or pages, uh, in memory. And if that's possible, great. Um, but even if that's not the case, even if the directory has to be put on disk, uh, is it still possible to get, uh, to get access to a, uh, to get access to a directory value in one page lookup? And if so, how? Yeah, so if, if the directory is laid out contiguously on disk, page one, page two, page three, uh, then you can identify which, uh, which page a particular uh, directory entry should reside on. Um, yeah, so hash tables are typically very convenient because they're also usually quite small, uh, so you usually don't have to go to that uh, extreme length. Um, there's a couple of, of general issues that come up with hashing, uh, namely that there's kind of this assumption that the hash function will distribute values uniformly, and this gets the prime uh, issue. Um, even a true random, a truly random function isn't going to give you a completely uniform distribution of values. Uh, but a hash function will, uh, a cryptographically secure hash function will um, uh, get pretty close. Uh, there are a couple of issues that have to be dealt with in a practical scenario, namely uh, what happens if two keys uh, end up with the same hash value. Um, you might actually need to implement overflow pages in the case that uh, one record or all of the records with, with a particular hash value don't, uh, don't fit on the same page. Um, corner cases are everywhere in computer science. Uh, and as I said, uh, you can, if, you, if a bucket becomes empty, then you can sort of merge that bucket back together by essentially combining its pointer with uh, the pointer to its uh, split image. 